If you have your Bibles, I'm going to be reading out of Luke chapter 23. We're going to start off with just one verse, and then we're going to move through several verses of this chapter of Luke chapter 23. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, once again, we come before you, God, and we pray to you, not because we're good people, but because you're a good God, that allows sinful men, Father, to fall on their knees before you and come boldly before the throne of grace. And so, Father, you hear our prayers, not based upon our goodness, but upon yours. And, Father, I pray this morning that, God, you would touch our hearts and change our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible uh, is sort of like a mirror. When we read the scriptures, it shows us who we really are. As a matter of fact, I've often found in my own personal life that when I'm living in a known sin, I either give up reading the Bible or I give up the sin. Because it's hard to face yourself when you see yourself in the light of Scripture. There was a song written by an uh, African-American slave back in 1899. And the name of the Negro spiritual was, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? The fact is, is that every single one of us really was there, even though it happened 2,000 years ago. Rembrandt realized this when he painted a picture of the crucifixion scene. And if you look at that portrait, what you'll find is Rembrandt has painted himself into the crowd. What happened that day is horrific. What happened that day we can't not even fathom a public execution by crucifixion. A scene so horrifying, it would be so hard for us to even imagine or look at. But the crucifixion that occurred that day was especially horrendous. You see, we have these images of Jesus upon a cross, don't we? We have these images, even like the video there of a man draped in a loincloth hanging on a cross. But the fact is, what really happened that day was Jesus hung naked, exposed. He has been beaten so badly, his, he was unrecognizable. That's the reason Pilate, when Jesus was brought into the room, said, Behold the man, trying to solicit sympathy from the people that wanted to kill him. Jesus had a crown of thorns placed upon his head. His head was beaten and bloodied beyond recognition. This crown of thorns on his head. You see how people died from crucifixion was that it wasn't the pain that killed them. It was actually because of the way they hung. They had to push up in order to breathe. And so you could imagine as Jesus was dying upon that cross, pushing up, gasping for life-giving oxygen. Blood pouring and flowing from the gapes of wounds where the nails were driven into his wrist and to his feet. There that day, as we look in the scriptures, we can see ourselves right there among those that surrounded the crucifixion and the cross. First of all, there were the religious leaders that were there. They were the ones who came up with the plan. They were the rulers of the Jews. They were the Sanhedrin. They were the religious folks. And it was their plan to have Jesus crucified. You see, they came up with this plan because Jesus didn't fit the mold of what they thought a Messiah should be. See, in reality, it is always seems to be the religious that crucifies Jesus. Isn't it strange? Isn't it strange that the most religious folks of that day were the ones who brought about the plan of executing Jesus? But we don't really find that strange, do we? For we find that even among ourselves today, that some of the most evil people we've ever met in our life, we've met in church. People who have depended upon their own self-righteousness to make them right with God. And let me say this, you don't have to come to church to be self-righteous. As long as you feel like you're good enough as you are, then you are depending upon your self-righteousness. If I were to ask you a question this morning, 
If you were to stand before God right now and God were to ask you, why would I let you into my heaven? What would you say? Many of us would immediately point to our goodness. We would bring about the fact of how we had helped people or how we were a good person. We begin to list off all the good things we had done. I find it strange that we often remember the good things, but we forget the bad things we've done, right? It's sort of like the time you went to the casino and won a little money and bragged about it, but you didn't brag about all the times you went there and lost. Or the time you hit that good golf shot, you want to talk about how close you came to that hole in one, but you don't want to talk about all the times you shanked it into the lake, right? Let me say this to you folks. God has seen your shanks. God has seen the very worst of you. In that moment, in the deepest, darkest secrets that you hope that no one will ever find out, that no one will ever discover, God was there. He knows every single thing about you. You see, God is not keeping a scoreboard. You know, sometimes we seem to think that he is. That somehow if we do enough right things, that it'll counterbalance the bad things we do. Maybe if we give a little money, that'll counteract the fact that we commit adultery or we're living in sin. Doesn't matter. You see, so we think that maybe at the end, when we stand before God, that somehow our good deeds will outnumber our bad deeds. Let me say this to you folks. God is not keeping score. Because the Bible says, John chapter 3, you all know the verse, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You need to read on down a couple of verses. Because what it says is for those who do not believe, they are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. That's what Jesus says. Jesus says that we are condemned already. How many sins does it take to send you to hell? One. All it takes is one choice. As a matter of fact, we were born in a sinful flesh. We were. Even as children, we chose to sin. Even before we knew what sin was, because we were born in sinful flesh. We all are sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus is not about being good. Jesus is not about attending religious gatherings. And too often times, people who come to church think the only thing that matters is fleshly and physical sins, you know? As long as we don't drink, smoke, or chew, or run around with those who do, we're okay with God. I find it strange that as we read one of the tests that Jesus uh, gives before getting into heaven, he talks about in Matthew when he divides a sheep from the goats. And when he divides the sheep from the goats, he says to those on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Because I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. I was sick, and you came to me. And they'll say, when? When did we do this? And Jesus will say, when you did it for the least of these, my brothers, you did it for me. So what's Jesus saying? Jesus is saying that the evidence of really loving God, of really being a Christian, is evidenced by loving people. It's evidenced by how you act and react toward others. Everyone in this room is condemned unless you've come to know Christ. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And when you stand before Christ, I hope you're not planning on claiming your goodness to get you into heaven. Because the standards you'll be judged by is not by the life of Wade Wallace where you better than him. It's not by the life of the pedophile. It's not by the life of those who are in prison. It's not by the life of those on death row. You will be judged by the standard of Jesus Christ. Are you better than him? Jesus says, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. What does he mean by that? Can anybody uh, come up to that standard? Of course not. But what Jesus is trying to do is force us to understand that by and in our own selves and in our own flesh, we are lost and condemned and in very much need of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Not only were the chief priests, the religious folks there, but also the Jews were there. 
In Luke chapter 23, verse 18 through 20, but the whole crowd shouted away with this man, release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. You see, the Jews represented a people that were stuck in tradition and ritual. You see, Jesus didn't fit in their paradigm. And what I find is that in most churches, the death of the churches is because of tradition. We've always done it that way. We've always believed it that way. And there are many churches this morning, there are many in church this morning, not because they want to better themselves, not because they're in love with Jesus. They're in church because they're culturally conditioned to be there. They're stuck in a ritual. You know what I found? I have found in my ministry sometimes, as I said earlier, the most evil people I've ever met, this is honest, I've met in church. It's true. The most judgmental, self-righteous people I've met inside church buildings. But let me say this to you. You see, even though they're evil and even though they're mean, you cannot help them to come to know God. You can't. You try to talk to them about salvation, man, they were born in the nursery, you know? They were raised in the church. Man, mama and daddy was, a, was a people of God. You know, my granddaddy was a preacher. My daddy was a deacon. Man, they were raised in church. They know all about the Bible. They know all about Scripture. They know all about what it's like to pray. They know all about all the good gospel hymns and the praise music. Man, they play that on the radio. And, but yet their lives do not align with what they say. They do not practice what they preach. And so Jesus says of them, they are hypocrites. They're pretenders. They just, play an, they just play an act or they play a role. You see, we can easily become culturally conditioned Christians. Think about it for a moment. Man, you can't turn on your radio and spin the dial without hearing some gospel preaching. You can't uh, spin the dial without hearing some gospel singing. Man, you can't turn on your television. It's on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can hear gospel preaching and gospel singing. There's so many churches I pass today just to get to this church where I pastor. Churches everywhere. And you see it so easily, especially in the Bible Belt of the South, to think because we are surrounded by the things of God that we know God. It's so easy to be raised in tradition that we feel like that because I love that good old gospel preaching or I love that good old gospel music or I love that Bible and I believe every word of it, that, that makes me right with God. Yet it doesn't. You see, I believe that tradition sends more people to hell than anything else. Because you believe a certain way. And it's so hard to get people saved who were raised in church sometime. Because they got baptized when they were six. It didn't change their life. But of course mom and daddy had a very emotional moment about it. And everybody was all happy and hugged them. And so they look back upon this experience. Let me say this to you. If that experience did not change your life, you better relook at it. Because when Christ comes into your life, your heart and your life changes. If your religion has not changed your life, you better change your religion. Man, that's why Jesus over and over and over and over and over again in Scripture, read it for yourself, says, there are many who will come to me on that last day and say, Lord, Lord, open to us. Let us in. You taught in our villages. We prophesied in your name. We preached in your name. And he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. Just because you're in church today does not mean you are destined for heaven. Because God had just soon to send you to hell from a pew as a bar stool. Man. You see, Jesus calls us to forgive, yet we live in unforgiveness. Jesus calls us to give sacrificially, yet we live for ourselves. Jesus calls us to love, yet we hate. He calls us to suffer, yet we seek happiness and pleasure. We are so close to the physical things of Jesus, we have forgotten the spiritual things of Jesus. 
And there was a one who was so close to Jesus, he touched him on the night before he was crucified. Think about it. Judas followed Jesus around for years. He was the church treasurer. Sorry, Deb. He, he was so close to Jesus, and Jesus called himself the door. He was so close to Jesus that he kissed and betrayed Jesus. He kissed heaven's door and yet went to hell. And how many of us do I fear will be like that because we're surrounded and we like the physical things of Jesus, but we do not know the spiritual Jesus. Thirdly, another one involved in the crucifixion, of course, was Pilate. In Luke chapter 23, verse 23 through 25, but with a loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. Pilate represents a person that had rather please man than please God. He'd rather please man than please God. He was swayed by whatever crowd he was with at the time. And that's like some of us. We're Lone Ranger Christians, aren't we? I remember watching a video years ago when I was back, at, back when I was in college. I think it was about five or six years ago. Anyway, I was watching this video back when they actually had old reel to reel. And there was this guy, man. He was driving down the road, and there's some old lady pulled up going so slow. He was cussing them. You know, he drove by, and he gave them one of those signs. Man, he was on the basketball court playing against his buddies, and he was cussing and knocking them down and, and griping the whole time and whining and complaining. Man, he went into the store, and, and he wanted a bag of chips, and so he, he grabbed them and stuck them in his pocket. But on Sunday morning, all of a sudden, he pulled off his shirt and opened it up, and there under was a big old ass, super Christian. Now it's church time. And that's the way some of us are. We play a role out there in the world, and whatever crowd we're with, we fit in. And then we can come into church and fit in. There should be a place where we understand and we can say, if the world fits, we're the wrong size. We need to understand that to be, uh, to know Christ is to be his representative. That's what the word Christian means. It means little Christ. Are you a little Christ? Are you a little Christ at your workplace? Are you a little Christ at your school? Are you a little Jesus everywhere you go? Do, when people see you, what do they associate you with? What do they associate with? Do people associate you with Jesus? You know, <laughs> when I read the book of Acts, there's a, there's a, there's a, a scripture in there where it talks about these disciples were so on fire for God that the people that looked at them said it was obvious they had been with Jesus. Is it obvious that you've been with Jesus? Is it obvious wherever you go that Jesus is your Lord? But yet Pilate, oh, he not only was swayed by peer pressure, he tried to blame others. Not my fault, it's yours. It's all on you. I wash my hands of this. I'm innocent of, of this man's blood. His blood's on you. Well, it's on us then, he, they said. I, I'm innocent of this. And we do the same thing, don't we? Oh, man, why, why aren't you living for Jesus today? Well, if my wife. Well, if my husband. Well, if my mama had. Well, if my daddy had, we blame the preachers, we blame the deacons, we blame the church, we blame mom and dad. But the reality is this, when you stand before God, God's not going to listen to your excuse. He's not. We choose to stand, we choose to follow, we choose to lead, we choose to follow. And with each choice that we make come the responsibility to accept the rewards and consequences of that choice. It does not matter what your mama did. It does not matter what your daddy did. It doesn't matter what your wife does. It doesn't matter what your husband does. You alone choose your destiny. You alone choose Christ. Too many of us are more worried about what people think than what God already knows. So true. The Roman soldiers were also there. Luke chapter 23, verse 26. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, 
who was on his way in from the country and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. Now I'm going to have to go through some of this a lot quicker than I want to, but let me just say this about them. They were people that were marked by duty. You can't blame them, right? You can't blame them for crucifying Jesus. After all, they were simply doing their duty. Man, they had mouths to feed. They had jobs to do. And many of us are like that. We don't have time for all this God stuff. We got more important things to do. The things that are important are shown by the priorities of our lives. We want the money, the fame, the power, and the pleasure. And so many things take priority over God and the building of his kingdom, which you and I are called to do. Let me ask you a question. Do you spend more time in prayer on Facebook? Oh, that's not an amen. That's an old me. Do you spend more time in scripture or watching TV? Your heart shows your priorities, doesn't it? What's important to us, we spend time doing. I find it strange. You know, at school, I used to do this thing where I got people to write down their top five most important things in their life. I got the students to do that. Then I got them to mark through them one by one until the most important thing in their life was there. Every time, it was the same. The most important thing in these kids' life was always God or family. And I asked them this question. Why is it the things that you say are the most important things in your life you spend the least amount of time with? Because it's true. You see, we take for granted that they will always be there, that our parents will always love us, and they'll always be there. Let me say this. Our parents will not always be there, and there's going to come a day when we are going to stand before the judgment seat of God. And it doesn't matter what else you've done, the only thing that's going to last is what you did for Jesus. Have you listened to your prayers? You listen to your prayers sometime. We say, God give me, God give me, God give me, God bless me, God give me, God help me, God bless me. Man, who's God here? You or God? You see, we want to order God around like a little servant. God, go do this. God, go do that. God, do this. God, do that. God, help me. Why, when are we going to understand that we are the servant and he is God? If he is Lord of our life, that means he's the boss and the ruler and the master of our life. And I think Jesus would say to us today what he said to his disciples 2,000 years ago. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do anything I say? Hmm. Also, there was another that was there at the cross. In Luke chapter 23, verse 35, the people stood there watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let, himself, uh, let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. You see, there were a bunch of folks just around the cross, a bunch of people. They were the multitudes, the masses. Maybe they had been to church. They had seen the Jesus show. They had seen the miracles. And so what they did was they simply stood there watching. They didn't do anything. They just stood there beholding. What does it take, as I said earlier, to go to hell? It takes nothing, just doing nothing. And how many times every day do we just stand there watching when it's time to take a stand for Jesus? I want to say this to you, and I want you to listen to me. Every person in this room within the next 24 hours will be given an opportunity to take a stand for Christ. You will be. You'll be given an opportunity to take a stand or to witness for Jesus either in your home or in your school or in your work. My question is, will you even recognize it? Will you stand up for Jesus and take that stand when that stand costs you something? When it either costs you a little bit of your reputation or maybe people being displeased with you. I believe the main problem today in our society is not the government. It's not even lost people and liberals. The main problem in our culture today are people who call themselves Christians who do not take stands for the name of Jesus Christ. It's time for us to quit looking to our government for answers. It's time for us to quit looking at liberals trying to quieten them down because lost people live like lost people. It's time for saved people to live like saved people. 
It's time that we take a stand for Jesus. And you will be given an opportunity to take that stand. But what are you going to do? You're going to sit there watching? Just beholding. Mm. Now there was a dying thief that was also there. Luke 23, 39. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and save us. He was guilty and he was dying right beside Christ. And in the midst of his suffering, on his deathbed, all he was looking for is a way of escape. Even now, a way out of the pain. He knew he was reaping what he had sown, but he wanted a crop failure. He wanted out of the pain, even to the point of blaming God. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and save us. And how many of us today, how many of us today blame God for not getting what we want? We come into church with our back ends on fire. We get just enough Jesus for things to get right and then we never come back again. So many times we see that over and over. We want our Lord. We don't want a Lord. We just need a Savior when life crumbles around us. When our pants are no longer on fire. We go back to doing what we want to do when we want to do it. You see, I hear people, and I've heard this said many times, Brother Dan. <clears throat> people say to me, I took Jesus as my Savior, and then I took him as my Lord. You don't take Jesus as anything. You see, Jesus is always the Lord. And if you want to come to Christ, you got to come to him as he is. He's not going to be your savior unless, he's, unless you're willing to make him your Lord. I've never saw any place in scripture where somebody came to Jesus that Jesus did not put a, a hard gospel message on them. Where he did not say you got to give everything to the poor. Where he did not say you got to pick up your cross and follow me. Where he did not say foxes have holes and the birds of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Now do you want to follow me? You see, too often times we don't want to count the cost because it's going to cost you something. What's it going to cost me to be a follower of Jesus? It's going to cost you your life. And the moment you try to walk away from that, you try to take him as Savior and not take him as Lord, you, you blaspheme the very gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus demands your, to be your Lord. And you have to receive him as that. The last one is this that I want to talk about. And there were more, but I'm running out of time. The last one is this. In Luke chapter 23, verse 40 through 43. Then the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly for what we are getting. Because we're getting what our de deeds deserve. But this man's done nothing. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Something happened. To this guy that was dying beside Jesus. There was something that went on. Maybe it was as he looked at this man dying beside him. And he heard him say. Father forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Maybe it's because he saw the compassion that Jesus had even through his pain. But whatever it was. He was moved by the Christ dying beside him. And he feared God. It says that. He said to the criminal on the other side, don't you fear God? In other words, I fear God. I'm about to go into eternity. And I'm afraid. I fear God right now. Today, if you knew this was the last day of your life, how would you live it? I have a feeling most of us in this room would live it in, on our knees, trying to get right with our family and trying to get right with God. He feared God. But not only did he fear God, he acknowledged his helpless state. He said, we're under the same sentence. I understand that I cannot come off this cross. I can't do this on my own. I'm going to die right here. Some of us in here today are in a helpless state. You're an alcoholic, man. You can't stop. You've tried to quit. You're a liar. You've made so many promises. You're an addict. You're a liar. Promises that you, that, that you maybe even you tried to keep for a week or a day. Yeah, it didn't last, did it? 
And so you try to cut from wine to beer, I mean whiskey to beer or whatever, and you've tried to go from beer to marijuana, and you've tried to go from meth to marijuana or to, to alcohol. You've tried all these things, but none of them seem to work. They just don't work for you. Let me say this. The first step toward healing, real healing, is to admit you can't do it. That's it. You have to understand your helpless condition. You see, because if you can do it, God's not going to intervene. You don't need him. It's when you realize that you need God to do it, then God's going to be there to help you do it. Not only that, but this repentant thief acknowledged justice and begged for mercy. We are punished justly, he said, for what we're getting what our disease, uh, deeds deserve. Let me, I, I, I really believe this. I'm not sure you can ever get to heaven until you realize you're going to hell. I'm not sure you can. You see, because you've got to recognize that you, not only are you a sinner, but you are damned because of it. And I'm not sure you can ever get to heaven until you realize you're going to hell. Now, I know that's old-time gospel preaching, but it's the truth. Because we have to come to the end of ourselves to understand that only, we can only be saved by the grace and mercy of God. And he understood that. That he had to depend upon the grace and mercy of Jesus. And so he confessed Jesus as Lord. And he placed his faith in Christ. In um, Luke chapter 23 verse 42. Then he said, Jesus remember me when you come into your kingdom. He realized that the only hope he had was hope in Christ. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When I stand before Jesus and he asks me, why should I let you into my heaven? I'm not going to point out what, how good I am and what good deeds I've done and how I preach the gospel and how I tried to counsel with people and how I tried to help with recovery. What I'm going to point out is Jesus died for me. That's all I have. His blood is sufficient. His sacrifice is sufficient. Man. It had to be such a great peace to that thief that was dying beside Jesus when Jesus looked at him, pushed up, gasping for air, and said, today, you will be with me in paradise. Man, you church folks, you know that guy deserved hell. <laughs> you are good people, decent people, not that guy. He was a murderer. He was a criminal. He deserved hell. But yet Jesus even forgave him. And folks, if Jesus for, for, could forgive him, can forgive you. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. Now, I don't know who got saved later that was around that crucifixion scene, but I know who got saved that day. That day, it was a murdering thief on the cross. And every single one of us and every single one of them that came to know Christ later, you all have to come the same way. Acknowledging your sin and your helplessness. Acknowledging uh, your, you cannot save yourself. Begging for God's grace and mercy and forgiveness. The willingness to turn away from your sin and to make Jesus Lord of your life and placing your trust in what he did for you on the cross as payment for your sin. Now, I'm going to ask if you would to stand with me because some of you today are like that thief on that cross. You are right there today. You know you deserve death. You know you deserve hell. You know you deserve the worst. But today... God's going to give you his grace. Are you ready? Today, God's going to give you healing. Today, you're going to be born again. Today, your life's going to start all over. Today, your life's going to turn and begin to go a new direction. Today, you're going to walk by faith, and you're not going to worry about what tomorrow brings because what matters is today. That's it. That's all you promised. Living for God today, one step at a time. 
So I'm going to lead you through a prayer right now. And as I lead you through the prayer, I want this church to pray with me. And some of you give your heart and your life to Christ for the very first time. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Now remember, it's not the words that save you. It's not the, uh, it's, you're not praying to me as you lift up this prayer. You have to mean it and you have to lift it up to God as though you are alone with God right now. Father, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Save me from my sin and save me from myself. I give you my heart. I give you my life. You died for me. I will live for you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, right now you can feel God doing a working in your life. You know, it's been so long since I, I've been saved, and sometimes I forget what it was like to just sit there in a pew and just feel burdened, man. Just feel so burdened. Just feel like, ah, oh, just this weight on my shoulders. But you know what's beautiful is when you step out, that first step out in that aisle to give your heart publicly to Christ, that first step, man, it's like that burden just releases from you. You see, God's going to ask you right now to do one thing. He's going to ask you to come forward. And I say, why? I thought I, could, I, I prayed that prayer. And that's okay. You don't have to necessarily come today. But there's going to be a time when you're going to have to be publicly identified with other believers. Because you're not intended to live this Christian life alone. So if you prayed that prayer with me, I want you to begin to step out right now. As Brother Kevin begins to play the video, I want you to step out right now. Come up here and grab Brother Philip's hand and say, I prayed that prayer with Brother Wade, and today I gave my heart and my life to Christ. Won't you come right now? The altar's open for others. Come on right now.